Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a pleasure and an honor to be chairing this panel with three distinguished scholars and practitioners. And I'd like to thank Fam FACT Family Office and its president, Mr. Larini, for putting this event together. It's a special treat to be here since this meeting addresses two challenges close to our work and our understanding of current affairs. One is the monetary situation, which as we know is still a very political system with all the risks that, are, uh, uh, that this entails. And we are right uh, in the midst of it with the euro. The second is the advantages of competition between jurisdictions or the absence of centralization, one of the factors explaining Switzerland's resounding performance in the times and also Europe's uh, historical success. And we are very much looking forward to listening to our speakers. Their presentations will be followed by a Q&A session for your questions. We'll first hear two different perspectives on the current European upheavals. One interpretation that we could uh, characterize as post-Keynesian, based on the workings of uh, fiat money, and the other from an Austrian free market point of view, which will be followed by an analysis of Switzerland's best kept secrets for its enduring success. I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Warren Mosler has more than 30 years of experience in the financial services industry with such firms as Bankers Trust and Beck and Company in New York and William Blair and Company in Chicago. He is a founder and principal in the Illinois Income Investors and AVM LP broker dealer companies and president of Valence Company in St. Croix in the US Virgin Islands uh, where he is currently based. There are surely worse places in the world. On the entrepreneurial side, he's also a director and major shareholder of Enterprise Bank and the president and founder of Mosler Automotive, a sports car manufacturer based in Florida. In the field of ideas, Mr. Mosler is the co-founder and distinguished research associate of the Center for Full Employment and Price Stability at the University of Missouri in Kansas City, which supports economic research projects and graduate students. He studied economics at the University of Connecticut, and he is widely seen as the founder of what has been called modern monetary theory. Please join me in welcoming Warren Mosler. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the organizers and give the translators a chance to translate everything I say. And I realize five seconds of English means about eight seconds of German or Italian, so I'll be pausing like that every once in a while. Uh, my first banking job was actually 1973, and so it's been 40 years now. And I consider myself an insider in monetary operations which is the actual central bank operations. I still visit the Fed regularly and uh, discuss those things. I grew up on the money desk at Bankers Trust back in the 70s, uh, where uh, it was critical to understand how the checks clear, how the payment system works in order to make your uh, investing decisions. Now, how do I change pages? Right arrow. Right arrow. Okay. Back then, they didn't call it MMT, but uh, Mosler, some people called it Mosler Economics, and it became MMT three or four years ago when a blogger uh, on Bill Mitchell's blog in Australia started calling it that, and the name stuck, and so I'll use MMT. I've got 30 slides in 30 minutes, so I'm going to try and do less than one minute a slide, save some time for some slides, and run through others. 1976, 1996, I put together a conference at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, the same site of the uh, original conference that started the IMF, to discuss the coming euro. Uh, I saw a serious problem with that. My business associates, I spoke with them. They saw the same kinds of problems. We got together. It was an uh, interesting crowd. We had 
people from all the major dealers. We had Charles Goodhart from the Bank of England and Bernard Connolly, who had just been thrown out of the EU unceremoniously, and <laughs> uh, academics and uh, all kinds of people. And, and so I'll be referring to that uh, in the rest of the slides. 1998, this is the history, the currencies were irrevocably locked. That was the same. The event in 2001 where it turned into the euro was secondary, that was, but it was 1998, the locking of the currencies was, was the main event. In the Treaty of Maastricht, now there are a lot of things in the treaty, I'm just going through the, high, the significant ones. Member nations retain their national debts, 3% annual deficit limits, bank deposits insured by member nations, and no ECB support for the member nations. It was called the no bailout provision. These were the cornerstones, okay? So what happened was, our point was, what Europe did was all the member nations changed themselves into what are effectively U.S. states. And so the analogy would be uh, that the states in the U.S. would be insuring the banks. So California would be insuring Bank America's deposits. New York would be insuring Citibank's deposits. We, we all know how long that would have lasted in the 2008 crisis. You know, less than 15 seconds. And that's exactly what happened in Europe. We, we talked about this back then, in 1996. Like the U.S. states, the new member nations were revenue constrained, like you and I, like all of us. Only the ECB would not be revenue constrained, like the Federal Reserve. What does that mean? They don't depend on taxing or borrowing in order to spend. They, and in fact, if you look closely at the accounts of any central bank from inception, they spend first and then they borrow. The way an insider says it is, you can't do a reserve drain without a reserve add. But all you have to know is they have to spend first before they can tax or borrow. The money comes from them. Think of a football stadium with its tickets. It can't collect the tickets until after it gets them out there, after it exchanges it for dollars or yen or euro. First it sells the tickets, then it collects them. So what did we discuss in 1996? And I, yeah, get my digital. Deposit insurance was not credible. Yes, they were insured, but it wasn't worth the paper it was printed on in a crisis. Member nation interest rates were subject to market forces. We discussed this back then and what that would mean. Member nation fiscal policy was pro-cyclical, again like the U.S. states. This means that in a downturn, they're all forced to tighten up. And in this last downturn, 2008, all the U.S. states tightened up. They raised taxes, they cut spending, they made it worse and the European member nations would be forced to do the same thing in a downturn. Cut spending and raise taxes, which is exactly what happened. Now, on the way up, it's the opposite, of course. In the way up, when things are good, all the states go the other way. They increase spending, they borrow like crazy, they lower taxes, you know, they're having a good time. Same thing in Europe. It's, it's the way down, so they're, that's what's known as pro-cyclical. They, they enforce whatever cycle's in place on the way up, runs up harder. On the way down, it falls harder. Only the ECB, like the Fed, can act counter-cyclically. Any central bank can act counter-cyclically. Only the ECB can provide credible deposit insurance. And the entity that insures the bank deposits must also regulate the banks. Once you insure somebody, it's your money, and you better regulate them because otherwise for them, it's somebody else's money. <laughs> and no telling what they're going to do. And we've seen lapses in regulation of government money all the time. Again, this was 1996 we went over these problems. So why would they set this up? Well, there were two possibilities. One, they didn't know any better. Of course, with all the degrees they had and with all the uh, credentials, that couldn't possibly be the case. So <laughs> people have tried to come up with other reasons, and the only one that made any sense was they did this to achieve a political consensus, which actually makes some sense. They wanted a euro, they wanted a single currency, they would put anything in there to get started. And then, okay, 
So they had to establish a treaty that would be ratified. A fully functional system that would actually work it would never get ratified. All right, but, but, so they put something that could get ratified and they let circ circumstances drive subsequent adjustment. So I understood that, we understood that. I said, okay, we're starting out here and we're gonna get to there because of circumstances. We're gonna to get to where the central bank is guaranteeing all the deposits. They're gonna be guaranteeing all the member nations. They're gonna be raising the master claims. But how do you get from here to there? Well, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. They're not gonna do anything without a crisis, we know that. But even then, how does it leap to the next one? Nobody could see that. It's how do you jump this chasm? And of course, that's what we're struggling with today, the same thing we struggled with then. How do you get from here to there? Uh, the new euro, it worked reasonably well on the way up, supported by private sector credit expansion. And I'll just flip ahead here. Here's private sector credit expansion growing as high as 10% up to 2006. And that was what was supporting the modest growth that we were getting. As soon as things went bad and the private sector can't borrow anymore, or it makes no sense for them to borrow, the whole thing collapses, like we said, and they make it worse, and they're still struggling now. Okay, so let me go back. It worked reasonably well on the way up, and it can work for a long time, just like any Ponzi scheme, like Bernie Madoff. Anybody heard that name? It worked fine for 10 or 20 years on the way up, but as soon as the game's up, it never works again. It, when the game's up with the Ponzi scheme, it's over. Nothing less than a Fed guarantee would bring Madoff's scheme back, right? Okay, same thing. If he had just arranged an IMF loan, not good enough. <laughs> okay, if, he had a, if your money was guaranteed by the Federal Reserve, fine, take the money. Okay, it all went bad in 2008. Circumstances forced change precisely as discussed in 1996. And there's your chart again. Post-2008 trauma. Lack of credible deposit insurance triggered the bank liquidity crisis, just like we feared uh, 12 years before. Market forces drove up member bank interest rates. You remember when they were all 25 basis points apart and people were saying to us, like, what are you talking about? You know, there's no interest rate problem. Look at Greece, they're funding themselves. It's like, yeah, Madoff was funding himself too. It's fine on the way up. These things never have a problem the private sector is pro-cyclical. It's on the way down that you get your problem. And we had some minor hiccups. It takes a big one, but once you trip, you fall, you fall hard. Member nations were forced to act pro-cyclically with austerity, ongoing. You take a bad economy, private sector credit demands coming apart, deficits go up automatically through transfer payments and falling revenue. Deficits go up some more, what do you do? You act pro-cyclically, just like the U.S. states. You raise taxes, you cut spending, you make it worse. And that is still in progress. The EU had two problems. The solvency problem. It got bad enough where Draghi said, we're going to do what it takes to end this problem. We, we know what would have happened. Well, we don't know what would have happened. We know it would have been pretty bad if he hadn't done that, because the whole thing was about to uh, end. Okay. And so we knew it was, had to get bad enough. That's how bad it had to get for the solvency problem. Interest rates escalated, unable to access funding at any rate. And that was not going to change without the ECB saying they were going to do what it takes. They set the stage with Trichet proposing a plan for the ECB. That was the break in the ice, so to speak. And it wasn't even allowed to be discussed in polite conversation that the ECB could possibly have a role in that. Suddenly, Trichet, he'd been out of there, but he, just proposing that allowed it to be discussed. Soon afterwards, Draghi came through with the uh, support. Again, there's no choice. It has to be that way. Okay, the output gap. Okay. okay, that's the second problem. So solvency they addressed. The output gap is unemployment. Uh, and let's get along. Circumstances forced the ECB to act beyond the spirit of Maastricht. The ECB provided unlimited bank liquidity, just like we talked about. They did it by expanding the acceptable collateral. There is no nation in the history of the world that's ever functioned for any period of time without it. In 1933, the U.S. closed down 4,000 of 8,000 banks because there wasn't deposit insurance and reopened uh, 
with deposit insurance. There's a reason there's deposit insurance. It's because it doesn't work without it. People have tried it. They would have left it in if it hadn't failed. It always fails, and uh, that's why we have it. Uh, the ECB allowed nations to recapitalize their banks with new issues of their own debt. That's what Ireland did. They issued Irish bonds, which the banks could then borrow against to recapitalize. You know, the whole thing was just a smoke and mirrors game to recapitalize. But again, it's the ECB writing the check. They, they are not revenue constrained. They spent a trillion euro last month. Okay. Did they, anybody talk about where they got it? Did they tax anybody? No. Did they borrow it from China? No. Okay. Chairman Bernanke was asked where the Fed got the hundreds of billions for the banks. He said, we use the computer to mark up the numbers in their accounts. Okay. It doesn't come from anywhere. The central banks are the scorekeepers for their currency. Like any scorekeeper, they just, it's just accounting entries. And they are now doing what it takes to ensure member na nations can fund themselves. But they're not doing it formally, and they're not doing it um, uh, on a you know, legalized basis. So it's still, they address the solvency issue, but the, it's, it's not permanent because they are requiring, it, there's conditionality, they call it. Yes, we will support you, but it's conditional. It's conditional on implementing austerity. You must act pro-cyclically. You must raise taxes, cut spending, make the economy worse, or we will not fund you. So they solved the funding issue, but the output gap continues to widen. Here's German household consumption. I picked Germany because it's the best. After all these years, you can see it's hovered mostly around zero, and they're doing well. A little blip up every once in a while does something any normal country would consider a, a bad day. And that's the strongest one. If I, you know what the others look like. They're just straight down. This is like a sinking ship, and there's a little bit still above water. <laughs> Restoring unemployment and output. Now, let me tell you, I'm looking at this from a practitioner's point of view. I've been 40 years in the securities markets. I, uh, my, when I ran my hedge fund from 82 to 97 before turning it over to my partners, we went 15 years without a losing trade. We had a 6% alpha, and I'm not trying to get your money. I'm not doing this right now. But the, the idea was if, when you, if you understood how these things worked, it gave you an advantage. So who else in the dealer community understands how this works right now? Who's on my mailing list? Uh, how about Credit Suisse, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Nomura, pretty much everybody. You go to a big financial conference in the U.S. now, more than half the people more than understand this and think this way. So people who are like get paid to be right about what's going to happen understand it this way. And when they look at the next thing, they're looking at it in this model, not because they have some philosophical reason to favor one side or the other. I mean, they don't care if you increase spending or cut taxes. They, they, but they know what works for markets and what these things do to markets. So a lot of what I'm telling you is related to what these things do to market forces. Okay, with tax hikes and spending cuts, every forecaster paid to be right, you know, not the ideologues who are just out there trying to uh, make headlines, but the guys who are paid to be right, they will lower their GDP and employment forecast. So, so when the U.S. raises taxes, cuts spending, they'll all lower their forecast by half a percent or one percent. When the U.K. does that, they lower their forecast. And if they're wrong, they lose their jobs, okay? It's not about trying to promote an agenda. And I'm not saying they're always right, but this is, this is what they do. With but they're, they're mainly right. This is what the Federal Reserve forecasters do. Okay, this is what the ECB forecasters do. With tax cuts and spending hikes, the same forecasters raise those forecasts. The ECB has fixed the solvency issue, so what's the problem? Everybody knows we can make this economy better by cutting taxes to let private sector grow, or raising spending for the public sector? Like, why aren't we doing at least one of those? You know, why aren't the politicians who want to cut taxes and, want all, and shrink the government pushing that? Why are they both sides promoting something that they both know makes the economy worse? Our Republicans let taxes go up by a record amount at January 1st. There's, they signed pledges not to do that. Okay, the Democrats let taxes go up on their own constituency, people working for a living, regressive punishing tax on payrolls. Like, why are they doing that? So they all want the deficit to be lower. Mm -hmm. Obstacles to recovery. 
okay, so I know this is going to happen. There's widespread agreement that, if you haven't noticed, that deficits are too large. Has anybody noticed that there's agreement that deficits are too large? Yes. Even Beppe Grillo, he states deficits much be lower. He's proposing debt reduction by repudiation. Okay, that's just a tax, right? It's a tax increase to get the deficit down. What does that do to an economy? Well, we saw it in Greece. Greece taxed bondholders 80%. Did unemployment go down? Did the GDP go up? No, it gets worse. Maybe not as a lot worse as if they had taxed somebody else or maybe worse, than, but it makes it worse. It doesn't work. Everybody in the Italian, you know, they, they could say there was opposition and whatnot, but they're all on that same side of deficit reduction, even there. The problem, unemployment is the evidence that deficit spending is too low. Now that doesn't mean we need more spending. It means for whatever size government we have, taxes are too high and need to be lower. Okay, or if you want a larger size government, fine. So depending on your politics, it means you either have to cut taxes or raise spending. I'm trying to keep the politics out of this. Okay, this is from a market's point of view. The ECB, EU, is demanding austerity in exchange for funding and the economy continues to deteriorate, to deteriorate as social unrest increases. The problem is the ECB sees its current financing role as temporary when in fact, it's now acting like all CBs necessarily do. They all backstop bank liabilities. They all fund counter cyclical fiscal policy. Okay? And Tina, which is there is no other way, is another way of saying it, is there is no alternative. Okay, so to recap, the problem, everyone agrees the problem is the debt is too high. Unfortunately, they're failing because the debt is too low. Okay, now where does MMT come into this? The big thing is the simple recognition that the currency itself is a simple public monopoly for better or for worse. You might not like it, you might want private money, whatever. I'm trading the markets, I, I gotta, I'm trading what we have out there. It's a public monopoly. The funds to pay taxes and any net savings of financial assets ultimately comes only from government spending or lending. It can't come from anywhere else. If I've got a dollar in my pocket, my first clue is it's signed by the Treasury Secretary. It can't come from anywhere else if it's not counterfeit. Okay. If you pay taxes, your bank's reserve account gets debited. It can only get a credit to cover that from the U.S. government. Nobody can credit the account that's used to pay taxes except the U.S. government. All the credits, all the dollars to pay taxes come from the government. Okay? So as a simple point of logic, the U.S. government spends first and then collects taxes, spends first and then borrows. Insiders in monetary operations know this. Again, the way they say it is you can't do a reserve drain without a reserve ad. Okay, there is no such thing. What is balance? Government spending, $4 trillion in the U.S., they're just crediting somebody's account. The number goes up in accounts. Taxes makes the number go down. It goes up $4 trillion, they tax $3 trillion. That's the deficit. We're running a $1 trillion deficit. That other trillion is sitting out there in somebody's account. That's called net financial assets. That's savings. Okay. Balance means the government spending is you know, equal to taxes plus the net savings. Okay. So government spending is always balanced by taxes plus net savings. If the government overspends and tries to shove too much net savings out there, you're going to know it because you're going to get inflation from this policy. You can get inflation from other things. The Saudis can raise the price of oil. You know, you can have crop failures that we count as inflation. You can have a VAT tax we count as inflation. But from monetary and fiscal policy, the inflation comes from too much spending. Okay. And, you, and there are other definitions of inflation, but without getting into that, I think you know what I mean. So if the government spends enough to cover the tax, but 
The trillion is not enough to cover the savings desires. People want to save more. Then, then we're not in balance. And the evidence is unemployment. The economy is looking to work to earn even more because it wants to save it. It's already paid its taxes. The dollars are going to just pile up as more savings. They can't go anywhere else. And because people are looking for work at current wages, we're not spending to the point of inflation. We're just hiring the unemployed. Again, it doesn't have to be government. Government could cut taxes, so the private sector would hire to the point of unemployed. Very important distinction. My first proposal now was to eliminate FICA taxes at year end, not raise them, to increase the private sector uh, spending. Unemployment is necessarily a monetary phenomenon. The money itself is a public monopoly. The monopolist is restricting supply. Any monopolist who restricts supply creates excess capacity. Day one, Economics 101, Macroeconomics, wherever it's taught, when they teach you about monopoly, the, monopoly res res the monopolist restricts supply, you've got excess capacity. There it is. The classics were right. Monopoly, unemployment is always a case of monopoly. And, but the monopoly is the currency monopoly. It's the monopolist restricting supply. It's right out of the classical economic textbook. Somebody called me a post-Keynesian at the beginning. <laughs> For a given size government, mass unemployment is evidence the economy is being grossly overtaxed. The answer is always, that's the economy we have, is being grossly overtaxed. The answer is always to cut taxes or increase spending, depending on one's politics. Turning litter into money. Taxing functions to create unemployment. What does that mean? I'm the government in this room. Here's my new money, my business card. Anybody want to stay afterwards and work for one of these to help clean up? No. Does anybody want to buy one for 100 euro? No. This is a, if I drop this, it's a piece of litter. I'm going to have to pay somebody to pick it up. OK. Now I'm going to introduce one new rule into this. One, I'm going to tell you one more thing. There's one door out of here, and there's a man out there with a machine gun, and he works for me. And you can't get out of here without one of these. Okay. Now, can you feel the tax? <laughs> can you feel what it's like to have a tax liability? You have to pay these or else you can't get out of here. Right. Now, who wants to work for one of these? Okay, what choice do you have? You're the economy. Nothing. Maybe I could sell it for 10 or 20 or even 100 euro if you really want to get out of here. The tax man turned litter into money. It's critical to understand this. Now, you can replicate this in any room full of people. You can tell all the stories you want, but you can replicate this. You can go through all the evidence, economic recorded history, and it's all consistent with this. When tax collection ceased in Beirut, the currency went worthless. When the South had a currency, it had inflation, but it kept a million men in the field in the Civil War because they had to use it for taxes until they lost, and then it went worthless. Okay, it's always the case, 100% evidence. Okay, now, why did I tax you? I didn't tax you to collect my cards. I, I don't need them. I taxed you to cause you to be unemployed. What does being unemployed mean? Unemployed means you're looking for work that pays in this currency. You're looking for work that pays dollars. You're looking for work that pays euro. You're not just looking for volunteer work. That doesn't count. Okay. The tax causes people to be looking for paid work. It creates unemployment. And then when I give you jobs that maybe take an hour of your time, there is no more unemployment in my cards because I've now paid you all. Okay, I've employed you. I've provided the jobs for the unemployed that I created. Now, you're just going to go back out and work for your euros, all that. I don't care if they're competing currencies or whatnot. I can use my currency to get you to clean my room if I can enforce my tax. If I can't enforce my tax, then you can just walk out. It doesn't work. Okay? The purpose of the currency in the first instance is always to provision the government. Now, that's why I say taxes function to create unemployment. Government spending unemploys, employs the unemployed that the tax created. If, I t if there's 50 people in this room and I tax you each one card and I only let you earn 40, I guarantee you there's going to be unemployment. There's at least 10 of you who are going to look to a job that pays this because you want to get out of here. Now, I'm trying to run a surplus. I'm going to tax you 40 and try and collect 50. 
something wrong with me. I put this system into default. Right? Why would I do that if I understood it? This is just stupidity. Okay, so why would the football stadium try to collect tickets before it sold them? You just don't do that. It's because every congressman thinks, every MP thinks he's got to get the funds to be able to spend. Now, if you're Italy, California, one of the U.S. states, one of the member nations, you're, they are like you. They're not like me. The central bank is like me. The U.S. government is like me. The European Parliament's like me. You've got to understand the difference between the issuer of a currency and the user. Who is pitching and who's catching? Who's making the rules and who's following the rules? Okay? And, and that just reveals how it all works and it gives you a much better understanding of what markets are going to do next, which is all that really matters. Forecasting the past isn't worth a whole lot. <laughs> Deficit spending is the source of net savings. If I tax you 50, and then some people want to earn some extras, and I spend 60, I run a deficit. Spend 60, only collected 50. Hey, your savings is 10. I can figure that out. It's easy math. If the government spends 4 trillion and taxes 3 trillion, that deficit of 1 trillion adds exactly a trillion to private sector spending to the penny. Or someone at the Congressional Budget Office has to stay late and find his accounting mistake. Demand leakages create savings desires. If you want to earn extra cards from me and put them in your pension fund, now you're willing to work for more than the tax. My balance is, what's balance for me? How much do I spend? If the tax is 50, if you each want to put one in your pension fund, my balance point would be 100. I'll let you earn 100. 50 go to the tax, 50 go into your pension funds. Okay? If government spending is insufficient okay, for the desire to pay taxes and net save, the evidence is you're looking to earn more for pay, unemployment. Silver bullet, how do we fix Europe? It's easy. The ECB guarantees deposit insurance, assumes bank regulation. That's what they should do for Cyprus, right? Then they don't have to put any capital in there. The ECB, I'd make the zero rate permanent. That's a long story, but I can, they guarantee the member nation debt. Now all the funding goes down to zero or 1%, whatever the policy rate is for everybody. They relax the deficit limits to 8%. But they better enforce it, not let anybody go to 10, 11, 15, 20, or you're going to have a bad inflation problem. You, because just like the U.S. states, you've got to enforce this stuff. You can't let everybody just go. Otherwise, you've got a race, an inflationary race to the bottom, which some places have done. And when you see that happening, you get short the currency and the bonds. Okay, but if you can enforce it, you're okay. The, in the European, I'll get to this later, it sources its uh, public goods and services in regions of highest unemployment. Does this happen? No. Okay, but that's what you'd have to do to fix it. It isn't going to happen. Instead, we're going to have continued austerity. Uh, it's going to expand to the financial sector with transaction taxes and various PSI. These are taxes on depositors, taxes on bondholders. It's the low-hanging fruit now. Do you want to, the next country to, go into austerity, they're going to either have to get rid of the last police officer and the last school teacher and the last public servant, or they're going to tax, you know, $20 trillion in savings accounts, I mean, you know, which is what politically makes sense. Well, look at Italy. Mr. Grillo, go after this, the bondholders, go after the savings account, go after the depositors. You might not like it, but the political reality is, you know, they've, they've taxed everybody else they can. And this is, this is the big thing left, and they're just going to go after it. And, you know, we said this with Greece, that they were going to do this, and now they're going to do it. And they said they would never do it again, and now they're doing it with Cyprus. Talk is cheap. The political reality is that's where you go for the money, where the money is. Wealth destruction by austerity continues, okay? And it makes the economy worse. It doesn't work. Unemployment and wealth destruction increase social unrest. Grillo... Really bad things happen. This, I wrote this before the tax on Cyprus. I had to send this in last week. Tax on bank deposits in Cyprus. That's it. Okay. How's my time? Five minutes left. Okay. 
because uh, these slides aren't numbered, so I don't know how far I've got. Okay, foreign additional topics, foreign trade, fiscal transfers, inflation, very big point, and employed labor, buffer stock, price anchor, CR can do. Foreign trade. If you go back to the old textbooks, everybody knew this. Exports are real costs. Real, we mean real goods and services versus just paper, nominal, book entry, real costs. Imports are the real benefits. And it's all about optimizing real terms of trade. Your real wealth is your pile of stuff. Everything you produce domestically, hopefully at full employment, if you can figure that out, plus what everybody sends you, minus what you send them. And that's what's left for your consumption. And optimizing real terms of trade was in all the old textbooks about how you, well, you exports are great, but the purpose of the export is the import. The purpose of producing anything is to use it. If you export, it's to get as many imports as possible for your exports. So for every you know, piece of cheese you can produce, you want to get as many Mercedes as possible. If you can put holes in the cheese and get even more Mercedes, even better. <laughs> okay, that's real terms of trade. And the Swiss have, you know, hugely successful at doing that. Fiscal transfers, something you probably haven't read anywhere, but all successful currency unions include fiscal transfers. Canada, it's written into the Constitution. The U.S. does it through the uh, budget process. Areas of high unemployment get preference for the next federal contract that goes out to try and equalize things. And there are big fights over that and whatnot. The, the reason, okay, there's a big fight is because they don't understand it. And the reason Europe doesn't want to do it and resist it is because they don't understand it, because they've got imports and exports backwards. And what happens is whoever, whatever region is, <coughs> is, has high unemployment, if you employ them to produce public goods and services, things for the, Europe doesn't have a common military, but if, if you did anything for the, for the union, but in the U.S., we'll, we'll go to an area of high unemployment and it'll produce military goods. Those people are working, producing goods that are getting shipped out. They don't get to consume those goods. They are producing for somebody else. They are working, which is an input, a cost. Someone else is consuming, which is a benefit. It allows them to pay their house and their mortgage. And I'm not saying it doesn't allow them to import a little bit, but it basically is helping everybody else a whole lot more than it's helping them, apart from a few small multipliers. And so it's an actual fact from the macro point of view, it's a cost to the region that had the unemployment. It's a real cost to produce this for the rest of the union. It's a real benefit to everybody else who can be producing things for themselves, public services, school teachers, health workers, instead of having to have those people produce military goods. The place for doing, producing military goods has fewer people to fix their roads, teach school, work in their hospitals, do all the public services, and work in the private sector because they have to produce the tanks and planes for the military. Okay. Once that's understood, it becomes much easier to promote fiscal transfers. And all unions have to have them, whether they like them or not. Inflation. The price level. Necessary. We have a monopolist. Monopoly's easy. You know how prices are determined when there's a monopoly. The monopolist is price setter and not price taker. See, you study monopoly for 15 minutes and you move on to the next one. Competition is the hard part, figuring out what the price is. Monopoly is easy. There's no choice. If you have a football stadium and you've got tickets, you've got to set the price. Yes, you can set the wrong price and nobody will show up. It's too high. You can set the price too low and too many people. But the market is not going to change the price of your ticket. It's your reaction function that will change it. It's not like you're out there bidding. When you have a monopoly, you have to set the price. The gov I have a monopoly on these cars. This abstraction is 100% accurate, okay? You, you need these cars to get out of the room. I can tell you one hour to earn a card or two hours. If I tell you one hour, it might be worth 50 euro to somebody else to do your work and let you get out of here for 50 euro. If I tell you two hours, I've just doubled it. If I pay you one an hour, 50 euro is where it would probably trade among you. If I say you gotta work two hours, it's gonna be, probably be worth 100 euro. If I pay two for an hour's work, I've just devalued my currency, 25 euro. 
It's a function of what I pay. Now, that doesn't mean it makes sense for public policy for the government to change prices. What it does mean is it tells you the source of the price level. Now, inflation gets, what we use for inflation includes a lot of other things, including taxes and everything else. That, that's not economics, that's politics. This CPI is inflation, no, that's politics, okay? But you can recognize what comes from the currency and what comes from other things. Repeating, inflation is confused with a one-time price adjustment. It's not a function of interest rates. If I told you you could earn interest on these cards if you had some extra and I pay you more cards, it's not going to affect anything. Okay? It, it, it's not caught, if inflation is not caused by excess demand, it's not cured by unemployment. If the Saudis double the price of fuel and it goes up, you can double unemployment. You're not going to bring it down. You, somebody's got to go over there and have a little chat with them before the price comes down or there have to be substitutes coming in or they have to lose their monopoly. But as long as they have a monopoly at the margin of nine million barrels a day and, can, and that gets sustained, you pay their price or you shut the lights off. Conclusion. The European slow motion train wreck will continue until there's recognition that deficits need to be larger. The continuing efforts at deficit reduction will continue to make it all worse. That's all I see right now. I don't see any, I see everything continuing to go in the wrong direction. I see when they're easing up on Spain, they just give them more time. They don't tell them they can go the other way. Just giving them more time. I hope I didn't run ahead of the interpreters. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>